Old Swanner here. In this video I'll be running through the approach that you can use to attack any problem you ever have with any chord changes you ever come across. Here I'll be running through the examples uh, written up in the companion blog article to this video on the Tapleture website. Uh, I'll put a link to that at the top right of this screen and also in the information box underneath this video. The thumbnail for this video, which I've shown underneath, uh, sort of gives the game away. Um, every chord we ever use and move between uh, needs at some point to, to hit the fretboard, which is when we fire it to the fretboard. Uh, if we're using those fingers somewhere else, we need to lift and we need to aim for the next shape we are going to use the same fingers for. Uh, there's a right way to do that. And that's what we'll be examining really today. Um, but first I'm going to begin just by looking at the mechanics of changing chords while strumming. Underneath I've written up a line of G and a line of D played using a basic strum, uh, which you may also have heard called a cowboy strum, island strum, campfire strum. It sounds like this. <laughs> Now the problem, if we want to change chords while doing that, uh, let's say I run the full line of G. My next downstroke needs to be on a D chord, but I'm stuck here on the G, which makes it pretty awkward to get the fingers across instantly as I strum down, like so. In fact, I've actually missed it there. It wasn't very good at all. Um, there's a better way, uh, which we will now proceed to look at. I've written the instructions in red underneath so you can see exactly where everything happens. Uh, running the top line, I get G and two and three and four. On the end of beat four, this off beat, I'm gonna steal that, hit open strings just to keep the sound going. Uh, there are three things come up at this point. You'll notice I've been tapping my foot along with this, which are the little markers underneath the count. Uh, red for down foot, blue for up foot. So on the end of beat four, there are three things come up together. It's my arm, foot, and chord. And what happens with the chord is I aim it for a D in the air, like so. So I now have a D prepared, and on the down foot, on beat one of line two, I fire that D to the fretboard, which means that I have three things going down, arm, foot, and chord. Vice versa, at the end of this line, I lift the D and aim for a G on the up foot, up arm. Putting it all together, two and three and four, change D, two and three and four. And if I run that with the backing, uh, slightly slower than I was just doing it. Assuming you can run the basic strum easily enough, uh, and if not, there's a link in the accompanying blog article to allow you to do that. Um, all you need is to get these chord changes up to speed, uh, ideally to the speed you want to strum at. I've drawn out the relevant movements underneath in a, a, an exercise, if you want to call it that. Um, just stretch it across a bar, change it from a G to a D and back again, mechanically correctly. Um, it runs like this. I'm going down on the G, up on the change, arm, foot and chord come together. I'm now ready for the D, and then I go down on the D, fire that to the fretboard. And again, vice versa, coming back to a G. So on the down, I fire, on the up, I lift and aim for the next chord. And you can use this system to examine any two chord changes that are ever causing you problems. I'm always
always reluctant to refer to this sort of thing as an exercise because it's possible you could sit there and repeat it for a long, long time and not actually get any benefit from doing it. Um, my term for it is it's a test. It's testing your ability to get between the chords G and D and you can apply exactly the same approach to measuring your skill at any pair of chords. Uh, so the boxes underneath are what I call benchmarking boxes. You can jot in there today's date and your current top speed. And then if your practice is any good, you'll find that top speed goes up. Conversely, if the top speed isn't rising, it's telling you your practice is not working and you need to find a better way to approach things. To help really understand this problem or any problem on guitar, it's always a good idea to try and break things down to smaller components and understand those better. Uh, the skill for getting between the G and D really depends on two things. The ability to hold or to make above the fretboard a D chord and the ability to make above the fretboard a G chord. So here I'm not touching the strings. You can see that these are pretty deeply programmed. I've been doing this for 35 years. Although how long I've been doing it exactly as, as crisply and cleanly as this, I couldn't tell you. Uh, so underneath I've drawn up the breakdown of how we can learn to hold the D chord better and better above the fretboard and we get that by changing it to itself. Uh, on the down foot I'm going to put my arm down to strum the strings and also put the chord down. So again three things going down exactly as it will be in context when we change from a G or indeed any other chord into a D. So they all go down together and then they come up together. The challenge to hold the shape perfectly so there's no calculation uh, to get the shape back it just goes down and like before we could very easily measure this uh, so I'll stick this on this is a free program called chord pulse light if you have a Windows PC uh, just a free download excellent it is and I can use that too that up to speed to find out what the top speed is and then jot that in the benchmarking box. Uh, you can't see that at the moment but just underneath. Uh, these are some free sheets you can grab uh, from the companion blog article. We'll link you to them uh, if you want to work them up to speed in the recommended systematic fashion. So the other half of practicing the G to D change, we've done the D to itself and now we do the G to itself. Uh, which isn't that different mechanically, just a different shape of the fingers. Still got three things going down, arm, foot and chord. Three things coming up, arm, foot and chord. Feeling the foot hit the ground exactly as your fingers hit the fretboard and the pick hitting the strings really at the same time as well. Uh, it, it, it's that strength the down up feeling that you're going to tie to a metronome or backing track to keep you spot in time with that um, and then you can jot down your top speed now if you find you cannot whatever you try get the D down and up to itself quite often I see people whose second finger comes out of position uh, but for you it could be any of those um, effectively if you're not keeping that shape it's tougher to land it and another common problem I guess is when you're landing and maybe the notes aren't quite sounding right uh, it's well worth being fully aware of all this stuff and uh, bearing in mind that this same approach works for the most complex chords understanding how to address that issue if you cannot get a chord up and down to itself is key taking the D chord as our example, let's say you can't get that up and down as demonstrated at whatever speed, there are problems in there. Here's how you can look at it a whole level deeper again. Uh, let's begin, we're going to take our D chord, stage one will be strum. Check that every note's perfect. When that's good, the next stage is to relax the left hand fingers on the strings without leaving contact with them. Uh, if I'm doing that at a slightly greater speed, you'll hear them go dead. Now at this point, I'm touching the strings ever so lightly. 
that if I strum them, the fingered strings will give me a click. Uh, next stage, we lift, and I suggest beginning by lifting as little as one millimeter. You're just trying to hold that shape, and it may go really, really slow to be able to do that. But if you take it slow enough, soon you'll be off the strings uh, and holding that shape, hopefully, as perfectly as, as it was held when it was touching the strings. And then stage four, we return to the strings to that light touching position again. So stage four is touch. So four movements, strum, relax, lift, touch. And hopefully you can see that this is really a breakdown of what's happening. When we're doing the full thing, um, we're just stopping really in that light position on the strings. Uh, now, now there you're not able to use quite the same muscles as when you're pressing on. Uh, so it's a good halfway house. And if you gradually build up the height that you lift the string, lift from the strings rather, when you come off them, um, you can sort of work that up day on day if necessary, uh, or it may even click in quicker than that. I've had some pretty surprising results with this over the years. Uh, so remember, strum, relax, lift, touch. And the pressure doesn't go on until we strum again. Strum, relax, lift, touch. Strum, relax, lift, touch. Uh, won't be long before you get that habit. And as I say, you can use this for any cause, however complex. If they're tough, take it right down to that level and you'll start seeing things that you will not see in the bigger picture. When you can change G to itself and D to itself happily, uh, you're in a position to start changing G to D. Uh, but I would expect you'd only be able to do the more complex one, shown underneath G to D, at uh, somewhat less than the speed you can do the weaker of G to itself and D to itself. Hence the benefit, the faster you can do G to itself and D to itself, the faster you can change G to D. Uh, to measure this, I've put uh, you can right click on these chords in chord pulse and split them down. So I've got one beat of G, one beat of D, as shown underneath. And if I run that at 40 beats per minute, that's going to be G, change, D, change, G, change, D, change. So with this or, or any pair of chords, jot down your top speed and make sure that top speed goes up. Uh, that shows you're getting better. If that top speed's not going up, you're just not improving at it. Um, what the measuring really does, it removes your perception from the equation. Uh, you're either better or you're not. And if you're better, keep doing what you're doing. If not, find a better way to practice. Using common patterns within chords is really useful. Uh, your brain likes patterns. It doesn't like remembering hundreds of dots all over bits of paper, but patterns it can work with, uh, and quickly too. Uh, you may have noticed I've been fingering a G using fingers 2, 3 and 4, rather than maybe the more common beginner's fingering of 1, 2, 3. Uh, in my opinion, there's no benefits whatsoever to that. There's lots of benefits to this G. Uh, number one, gets the little finger working. Number two, um, <laughs> We've got fingers free to do some clever stuff at this end. Uh, you can't really do much with the little finger on this side. Um, but the third one is sort of highlighted underneath. If you look at the common pattern that I've circled between all three chords now, G, C and D, uh, there's big merit in using that as a real mental anchor as we change between the three of these chords. Why that works is that we're almost thinking of just putting two things down on the fretboard now rather than three separate fingers. It's almost like if I go from the G to the D, there's that pattern to land and then finger one. When I go from the D to the G in reverse, there is that pattern to land and finger four. It's almost less for your brain to keep track of. Uh, where people often go wrong, I'll see them lifting this pattern and then they lose the pattern as they come across to the D and then have to rearrange afterwards. It costs them a lot of time. Um, an easy way to get this habit is to, to break it down maybe like so. Strum the G, lift off finger four,
bring the pattern to the top two strings, put down finger one. Strum that, lift off finger one, bring the pattern to the bottom strings, put down finger four. But the, the key is that finger three and two hold their shape as you move. Uh, so that also works for G to C. And if you've never fingered a G with fingers two, three, four before, look at the, uh, the minimal movement in my big bits of meat, the arm and, and the shoulder and the elbow, um, just to get from a G to a D. There is no movement. I can do that all with the fingers. Uh, compared with the one, two, three fingering for the G, in which you can see my elbows moving a big distance, your shoulders opening up. All three fingers have to go miles across the fretboard. Uh, although that's possibly slightly easier for a beginner because it doesn't use the little finger. Um, I, I think the downside is, is too great not to tackle this fingering if you've never done that before. Anyway, putting the three together, if I was to do a G change, C change type thing, and then to D, G change, C change. Hopefully if you watch my second, third finger pattern, you can see that remaining pretty well structured throughout. As another example of using the patterns within chords to help pick up on, on complex looking chord changes, uh, here I've drawn up uh, an E diminished seventh. Uh, now this is a chord, if, if you've got a song with that in, you've got no choice but to play it. Um, and the first time you try it, I remember it used to put me off any song that had that in. The name looks ugly and the shape looks ugly. But uh, if we look past, um, look past the shape, as a whole and picture it without the G note there and you can see that inside this is just a D shape but moved from there's my D chord if I just push those fingers inside one string there's three notes of that diminished and then I can add the fourth but again I'm almost thinking right there's one thing there I need to get down and one more so rather than four whole new positions for fingers to remember you can picture the pattern and a fourth finger added into it then of course, if you want to work this up to speed, we need to be able to, to down and up that. And you can use all the ideas and tricks that I've suggested earlier in this video to do that. A fairly common complaint is not being able to change between open and bar chords. Underneath I've drawn up a C changing to F, an open C changing to a barred F. The good news is, mechanically, we can approach this exactly the same as we've just learned to do G to D. As I've said, this applies to any two chords, however complex, so it's no different here. We need to be able to change C to itself and F to itself. When we can do that, we can change between them. Same thing. Fire a C, then lift an A for an F, fire an F and lift a name for a C. Now you might imagine that the open chord changing to itself is a whole lot easier than the barred F changing to itself. Uh, if you were to measure the two I'd be very surprised if you were faster at the C than the F. Uh, maybe we'll take a deeper look. Here then is where I would consider the bottleneck in changing from an open chord to a bar chord and that would be the bar chord to itself. So I've drawn it up, same mechanics again, down on the uh, on the F chord and then lift off completely. Now I'm pretty confident my notes are sounding there. If you're not, it may be worth getting inside the bar chord a little deeper and I'll put, uh, well, in the blog article there'll be a link to some slightly deeper stuff relating to bar chords and making sure all the notes are sounding a uh, slightly different angle of attack on that. Uh, either way, if you want to be able to strum with quality chord changes going from C to F, you want the C to itself and the F to itself up to at least the speed you want to be able to do that at. And of course with your measuring boxes you can keep a track of that. So if you want to play a song at 120 beats per minute, 
ideally you want to be able to do the C to itself and the F to itself I'd say above 120 beats per minute um, and then you should be able to do the C to the F maybe at about 100 perfectly but you'll always get a bit more speed if you bluff it um, in, in a playing situation you get away with a little bit um, as long as you're aware where problems lie anyway uh, we don't want you repeating uh, duff chord changes but if they sound decent enough as long as your rhythm is strong things will hold together just one last little bit on, on sort of changing chords while strumming uh, a fairly standard or my, my preferred way certainly of uh, getting the chord changes in rather than let's say I've got a basic strum and I'm doing C barred and F barred rather than lifting completely off there and hitting open strings between the changes I would generally just put a click there I'm relaxing the fingers on the strings while I move and just get a click like that on the the and of beat four so F, two, and three, and four, click. Mostly that's just personal preference. Some people may prefer to lift off and get the full jangle. Uh, I, I don't know, but I mean, this works great with power chords as well, where you probably do not want to be lifting off. And the system's really the same. We're just, rather than lifting completely from the strings, we relax the hand. And we can practice that as shown underneath. There's my C. And then I'm going to click while I move to the F. Again, all the work as ever done on the upstroke, I've aimed for the F. So it's really C, click, F, click, C, click, F, click. And in context. I'm not holding this guitar very well. And of course you can pull the change out as shown below. And as ever, that's how it plugs into the, the full strum pattern in context. Uh, so if I was doing with power chords, again the click. probably doing that sort of stuff already but if you've never seen it before that, that may open a door or two. Underneath now I've got the toughest part in my opinion of the Stairway to Heaven intro uh, which we can use as a, an example to show a nice way to break down a lot of fairly complex chord changes to see inside those a bit clearer. Uh, so this pattern one and two and that's my C with a, a G bass going to D with an F sharp bass. Um, so this is the tough bit of that intro for you. This one's pulling out and again you can download you know, some progress sheets on, uh, for, for this one from the blog article linked in there. Uh, but if you measure the top speed you can do that at just backwards and forwards. It's not an easy change. Uh, if I had to gig that this weekend I'd be practicing like mad. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the way I'd be practicing um, is slightly different than just repeating that, uh, which I will discuss with you next. Now, can you guess how I might suggest you master this chord change? Uh, well, th there are two chords involved, so we need to be able to change each to themselves or to itself. G to itself and the uh, the D slash F is down here. You can see you can download these sheets uh, through my blog article for free. Um, move down to that one and the D slash F sharp. <laughs> to itself. Now when the two chords are functional to themselves uh, you've got a good chance of being able to get between that one and that one with what is really an instant change. We've got our one and one and two and 
and then beat three is on the next chord. There's no hiding place here, there's no cheat available. Uh, we have to go from that instantly to that. And one of the, uh, the best ways of breaking down that problem I will put up next. Here's a great way to break down then uh, this problem, but also any problem that involves going up and down the neck while you're changing the chord shape. And it's a, it's a fairly simple solution. We just ditch what I call the vertical movement up and down the neck. Uh, so now rather than going to this shape at fret two, we go from our first chord to this shape at fret five. Now by doing this we can see that what's really happening is uh, the bars staying down, that will be sliding down, although of course without pressure on. Uh, there's still really a lift and an aim and a fire in there at some point. Um, but from the first chord I'm going to be lifting off finger four and now placing fingers one and two down. And if I come back to the uh, previous chord, same in reverse. Now it should be clear there's no benefit in when I'm playing this shape losing sight of what these two fingers are doing. If I'm going to use them there again I may as well have them prepared and I can keep them prepared when I've lifted them off from once I've done this I keep these two fingers here but likewise with the fourth finger you know when this comes off I may as well keep it in the most efficient position pointing back exactly where it's to be used. Uh, so often I'll see people trying this and you know, the, the fingers come over here and it's tough to get them down when that's required. Much tougher to turn that into that than it is to turn that into that. Uh, so we can pick up on what you might call a good habit uh, by staring at this in the simplified situation. You can benchmark that simplified version off and bring that up to speed. Um, it's always likely to be faster than this more complex version. I'd, I'd be amazed if you could do uh, the one that's now shown underneath faster than the one we, we just examined. Uh, anyway, by the time you've practiced the previous one up to speed, you're now going to be aware that it's very beneficial that while we're playing the C slash G in stairway, you have got fingers two and three aimed already for the correct strings, so that when we move down, it's still uh, well, it's really just what we practiced before, but now with the vertical movement added back in. Finger four lifts off, we put down fingers two and three. And if I want to practice going back and forth, I keep finger four in its plane of action above the top E string. If you've never practiced like this before, you're probably going to find you can really work some new muscles uh, in fingers two and three by having to hold them in position. Uh, and then what you'll find is that the development of the muscles in this particular example helps a huge number of other things you can play. Uh, you've only got four fingers, you get them better for one piece of music, they're better for all pieces of music. Well that's taken a fair while to get through, uh, matching up with the longest blog article I've ever written. If you've enjoyed it be sure to check out the blog article, remember it's linked in the top right hand corner of this video and in the information bar underneath. And uh, on the Tap Literature website, there's plenty more to keep you busy if you like this approach to stuff. Maybe I'll see you there someday.